Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Skip Mason. Pastor, preacher, historian, author, teacher, librarian, archivist, world traveler, collector, family historian, avid reader, and creator of the popular Vanishing Black Atlanta Facebook page. But a lot of folks who love history. Most, Most importantly, importantly he's, our he's our dad, who loves his family, and who taught us the importance of our history and having important conversations. Join him now for this episode of Conversations with Dr. Skip. My brothers and my sisters, you see these wonderful faces of these great aspirants who are with me uh, on today. I am so delighted uh, to have Reverend Manuel Henderson. Reverend Denise Anders Modest, Dr. Philip Washington, and Dr. Wayne Williams as my guest today. And you will see them live and in person momentarily. But let me just uh, greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. I'm so glad that you are here with me uh, on this, the final Meet the Candidates slash Aspirants Forum. Uh, and we have been truly blessed by uh, having uh, most of, if not all of our candidates here who are offering themselves for office. And in the event that you have not seen any of the previous shows, they are available uh, on the CME Church website, on the CME Church Facebook page, on the When We Were Colored Facebook page as well. And you can go back and uh, check out uh, their uh, interviews. And I'm just sort of flashing uh, images of those that I've had the opportunity to, to share with uh, and interview our, our candidates uh, for uh, general personnel services and finance and investment. And uh, of course, uh, evangelism uh, and lay ministry to men. Uh, but today uh, we have the last of our candidates. Let me greet uh, Bishop uh, Lawrence L. Reddick, our senior bishop, and Mrs. Wendy Jones Reddick, the College of Bishops, and their spouses chaired by Bishop James B. Walker uh, and Mrs. Dolores Walker. Let me greet my bishop, Bishop Thomas Lewis Brown Sr., uh, and Dr. Louise Baker Brown, uh, and forever grateful to Dr. Teresa Duhar uh, for her uh, tremendous support. We are on our way to Cincinnati for the General Conference, the 39th Quadrennial Session and the 40th Convening of the General Conference. And there are a whole lot of things that have been planned, but I'm excited about one event that I wanna share with you uh, that will take place. Allow me to uh, share a little bit of this clip because our opening reception is gonna take place at this magnificent National Underground Railroad Museum. just wanted to give you a, a taste of what we're going to see. And right now I'm bringing to the screen uh, these aspirants uh, who are offering themselves uh, for uh, the Episcopacy. Uh, and we are so delighted to have them here uh, with us today. Let me introduce them. We have the Reverend Emmanuel uh, Henderson, who's the pastor of the Lane Chapel CME Church in Shreveport, the Fort uh, Episcopal uh, District. Uh, so glad to see you, uh, Reverend Henderson. We have the Reverend Denise Modest, who is the pastor 
uh, of the Trinity CME Church in Memphis, Tennessee, out of the First Episcopal District. We also have Dr. Uh, Philip Washington, <clears throat> is the presiding elder uh, of the Detroit and Mid-Michigan Districts, Pastor Doja Memorial, CME Church, Flint, Michigan, out of the third Episcopal District. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Wayne Williams, the presiding elder of the Greenwood Jackson District, Pastor Lynch Street, CME Church, Jackson, Mississippi, the fourth Episcopal District. Uh, we are so glad, I, I got to say, that this is the first time that the aspirants have all applauded and clapped for each other. I don't know whether it's just that you're glad to see each other <laughs> or, or that you are excited uh, that, that we are getting into the final stretch uh, of what has been a long and obviously arduous journey for each of you. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to having uh, conversations with you, but our first conversation uh, will come from uh, Reverend Emmanuel, I want to say Emmanuel, Reverend Manuel Henderson, Thank as you. well as I know my fraternity brother. So I'm going to put the rest of you uh, in the green room and we will be back with you uh, in just a moment. Uh, before we have our conversation, uh, Reverend Henderson, let me just share something with uh, our wonderful people. 42 years ago, I received my first pastoral first appointment pastoral at the age of 19. The age of 19. Since then, I have Since faithfully then, served the CME Church the in the 1st, the 3rd, the 4th, the 6th, and the 8th Episcopal Districts. I presently serve as the pastor of Lane Chapel, Shreveport, Louisiana. And there is literally no better man for this moment. Um, in public and in private, Reverend Henderson is the same. He loves God, he loves people, and he loves the CME Church. One of the things that I admire the most about Reverend Henderson is that he is the true definition of a servant leader. Time and time again, I have personally witnessed him put the needs of his church members of the church itself above his own. Over the years, he has worked closely with my father assisting him, which means that he got the opportunity to see up close and personal some of the things that you experience as a bishop and some of the things that you have to do and endure as a bishop in the CME Church. I know that he loves the CME Church and equally important, he knows the CME Church. Reverend Henderson graciously served as the host pastor for our Missionary Corps General Assembly held in Shreveport in 2019. With all of his outstanding experience and his great work ethics, I believe he has all of the necessary qualities to become a bishop in the CME Church. I'm asking you for your support, your prayers, and for your vote that I may continue to serve you faithfully as one of the bishops of our Zion. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing uh, that, um, Reverend Henderson. Let's jump right into it. You are offering yourself uh, for the Episcopacy and I want you to tell us why now and, and why you for such a time as this in our church. And this will kind of serve as your opening uh, statement to those who are watching. And those of you who are watching, take a moment to please share with <clears throat> others. Reverend Henderson, tell us why now and why you are the one. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mason. First for this program, I wanna say thank you for allowing us to uh, get together and to share uh, with, uh, the delegate since we are not able to meet with all in person because of COVID. But let me just say that I, first of all, I'm a proud graduate of Lane College, one of our uh, CME schools. And uh, I've earned the Bachelor of, of uh, Science degree in business and accounting. I, I come to this office uh, uh, offering in uh, 42 years of pastoral experience. I have served uh, in over half of the Episcopal districts the first, the third, the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth Episcopal District. I have sat where the people sat. I have served as a steward at my local church, a treasurer for a couple of annual conferences, a treasurer, uh, a director of Christian education. I've served on the joint board. I've served on the compilation committee. I've served as a chairperson of the ministerial examination committee. I have been the delegate to eight uh, general conferences. I have served in every area, 
And as for ecumenical, uh, uh, I have served as the regional coordinator for the Louisiana uh, Inner Church Conference. I've served as a site coordinator uh, for the after school tutorial. Uh, I've served as the board of directors in the Capital Association for Social uh, Enrichment. I also bring to the uh, table, to the bench, administrative uh, skills. I, I hold a degree in business and accounting. I have held two businesses, two successful businesses, and I can bring that information to the church. So I ask that uh, with this 42 years uh, of accountability, commitment, and integrity and experience, that you give me the opportunity to continue to serve you as one of the bishops of our church. Thank you for this opportunity, Brother Skip. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your, your opening statement, uh, Reverend Henderson. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm used to calling him Manuel. You can uh, call him Manuel. Thank you. That's, that's my brother. I want to respect our, our formal relationships. Uh, of course, Wayne has already told me, you know, it's Wayne and Skip, um, <laughs> but, but I, I certainly want to do that. Let's get into some of the questions that we we have uh, from uh, many of the people who have watched over a period of time. And I want to put this first one up. So mm -hmm. is the bishop of the CME Church, in your opinion, the pastor's pastor? Why or why not? And then the second part of that, uh, Manuel, is if the bishop is the pastor's pastor, and if you are elected, explain your plan for guiding pastors to spiritual, emotional, physical, and financial health. First part of that question, is the bishop in the CME Church the pastor's pastor? Why or why not? I think that question, uh, Brother Skip, for me is a misnomer. I say it in this sense. Let, let me first qualify by this way. When we are pastors, we are sent out to be pastors of our local churches. But I understand that just because the bishop gave you an appointment certificate, it may make you in charge of that church, or it may make you the pastor, the general pastor of that church, but it does not necessarily make you the pastor of all the people. In order to be the pastor of all the people, then, then they must uh, generate a relationship with you. I said that to say this. I, I believe that as a whole, the, the, the bishop serves in a pastoral capacity of the entire uh, church. But I, I don't know <clears throat> uh, if I would go as far as to say that the bishop uh, is the pastor's pastor in that Episcopal district. I say that in this way. Uh, as similar to being a pastor, the, the bishop is also the pastor's boss, uh, if you want to put it in corporate terms. And when there are some intimate things going on in your life, how many of us will genuinely share that with our bishop, knowing that it might have some effect on our pastoral appointment? If you have some issues in your family, if you have some other issues, uh, uh, how many of us would genuinely share? The other side of that coin is, uh, I hope it's not taken out of context, um, you have to have a relationship with the person that you make your pastor. What I mean by that is the bishop may not have a personal relationship with all of the pastors, even though I think bishops do their best to visit, etc. So I, I don't know if I would uh, make the bishop uh, the pastor's pastor, mm -hmm. but if I am uh, uh, the fortunate to be the pastoral person of the Episcopal District, I, I think I would, um, first of all, break down the walls, the barriers, uh, and, and let pastors feel that they can come and, and, and talk to me without fear of reprisal. Because I think when we do that, uh, then we, we help the pastor and we enhance the church at the same time. Uh, and I think um, we, we need to have some sessions because I, I've been, I, I didn't want to say it all in the beginning, but I served as a pension and records clerk. I've, I've been the administrative assistant to at least four bishops. And I have seen pastors pass away and we have to pass the hat to help bury them. So I think we need to have some kind of uh, forums to teach our pastor financial accountability, how to do that. I have a degree in accounting and business. I think I can help 
in that area so that it will lighten the burden uh, on the pastor and on that family. But no, in, in, in generality, I, I would not say that the bishop is the pastor's pastor. So you've kind of alluded to the last part of the question about financial health. Mm -hmm. physical, emotional, spiritual. I think people want to kind of get a sense from all of the candidates, what kind of bishop are you? You know, we, we know you as a pastor. Does it change? I mean, are you, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You tell us, you know, to address some of those issues. What do you plan to do when you're elected? Uh, if you are elected, what do you plan to address some of those issues with your pastor that you will be uh, overseeing? In, in I've had 42 years of experience uh, as a pastor. One thing I do know is no one plan works with every pastor, with every uh, a person. I, I would put some uh, plans in place, uh, not necessarily doing them myself, because I don't think the bishop has to do everything him or herself. But I think we need to put some things in place, uh, for instance, bringing people in uh, to help with, with uh, mental stability and, and teach pastors how to take care uh, of themselves. Because if the pastor is not well, then he cannot adequately take care of his church. Uh, I, I believe uh, in health. Uh, I, I'm a health abbot. Uh, I don't say much about it. I just do it. Uh, I'm 60 plus years old. I take care of myself. I don't take medicine for anything. Just had my physical flowing, you know, a great, great a physical, nothing, still no medicine. So I think we need to teach pastors how to take care of themselves uh, physically. I think we need to teach pastors how to take, take care of themselves uh, spiritually by having a retreat, by asking them to come and, and, and let the bishop share, you know, one-on-one -on -one or with the pastors, bring somebody else in, bring some people in to take talk to people about resources. I, I did it at one of my ministries with the senior citizens, talk to them about uh, uh, what, what's being offered to senior citizens uh, about the scams, etc. I, I think when we talk about ministry, we usually stop with just the spiritual side. But I believe we have to take care of the whole person and bring in resource persons to help us to help pastors be their best self, so that they can be the, so they can be the best pastor they can for their congregations. Thank you very much for responding. Now let's transition to and talk about some of the areas that come up, including young adults. What, what is your plan to retain young adults in the ministry, uh, men uh, in the ministry, and reaching lost souls? That's a, that's a lot of questions, brother. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start off with young adults. And if I you know, forget some, please remind me. Let me start off with young adults. And I hope this is not taken out of context. I think sometimes we forget as pastors and older lay people and bishops that young adults are adults. Let me see, can I explain what I mean? <clears throat> when I came out of seminary to pastor my first church, I was about 25 years old, I believe. And at that time, coming out of seminary, you know, we had our, our theological degree. We, we grow a beard, so I guess, so we can look scholarly, I guess. And I went to one of my churches, and one of the adults, I think he was on the chair, Stuart Gore, he was, I don't know, 70 years old or whatever. And here I am, a young adult. And he asked me, he said, Pastor, what are you doing growing that beard? I, I've learned to answer a little bit better now. But I said to him, I grew this beard because I'm grown. I said, I may get older, but I'm not going to get any grown. We have young adults who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies who run banks and computer firms, etc. But yet we don't think they are uh, 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 in a place where they can help us run or actually run our church. I think we need to give place to our young adults uh, and remember that they are adults. And, and, and we have to be careful about labeling them as young adults. They are adults. Give them the opportunity. Every church I've been to, I, I, I don't uh, get rid of my seniors. You can't do that. But yet I give place to young adults. What I have done, Brother Skip, 
there's nothing that this one that say we can't have co-chair person of this and that. So I have I, I put a senior citizen and a young adult so that they can see what I'm doing. And and after a while, one of the young adults, one of the uh, seniors said to me, Pastor Henderson, I see what you're doing. I know you want us to teach them, but we've done uh, enough. Now it's time to let them take over. But we need to start it in the beginning to give them the opportunity uh, uh, to be involved as stewards, as trustees, whatever, they, whatever it is. And, and give them the opportunity and, and, and not micromanage them. Let them make mistakes. Let them take risks. I did. I've been a pastor since I was 19 years old. I've made a lot of mistakes, but there were some adults that helped me along my way and cheered me on. And now I believe you talked about uh, men. Yeah, one, yes, one of the questions had to do with retaining <laughs> men uh, in, in the church. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Uh, yes. Episcopal uh, candidate? Yes. Well, and my thing is, now I want you to understand in answering these questions, Brother Skip, uh, in most cases, bishops don't pass the local churches. I only know one. Yeah. So we, I, I, so we, we, the, the information I'm giving you is what I can help my pastors do uh, as a bishop because bishops don't have the right to go in and inject and tell that pastor, even though some may. Uh, once that pastor's in charge, that pastor's in charge of that church. But what I've done as a pastor, um, for a number of reasons, uh, we had more women in church than men. And I wanted to address the, uh, the problem of men and women. Most of the time, as pastors, we get happy with just the women working. And, and we don't do anything uh, for the men. What I have done was I have asked the men. I just come out and ask them because I can't read their mind. What is it you like to do? And they have said to me, <clears throat> we like to fish. We started a fishing club. You know, whatever it takes. Because another question I had, one of the women said to me, my husband thinks I spend too much time at the church. I'm, I'm in this, I'm in that. So what I did was I got that husband involved. Uh, made them greeters and, and, and gave them other things and trained them, made that husband a part of, of the officers of our church. And we have to, we have to do things that to get men in, and but we have to ask them what they like. A lot of time we try to do things that people are not interested in. But if you have something that men are interested in, it's okay to have a golf club uh, 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 in your church. It's okay to have a dummy nose club in your church. And if you don't mind me saying, Skip, I love to play dummy nose and talk all the trash. I love to play spade. We have to give men something uh, to do in the church. And when we and I've done that with my members. And and and, my, and I don't mind telling them when we play dummy nose and act a fool with them, call them fish box and turn them green. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right, right. So I think we have to find areas where men are comfortable uh, in the church and let them do it. And once we get them in there, I've discovered that once we get men in the church, we got the whole family. Yeah. The wife, the husband, and the children. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you responding to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you did say a couple of things about the fact that, you know, as a bishop, there are things that you do, there are things that pastors do. Exactly. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate that. Just trying to respond to some of the questions, mm -hmm. because I think what the people want is because I believe all of our aspirants are qualified uh, to serve but they want to know what do you bring uniquely? Let's ask this question. What are your <laughs> thoughts on consolidation when it comes to several small struggling congregations, consolidation and merging of, of churches uh, in our, uh, particularly in a particular dom denomination that you might be assigned over? Uh, if I, uh, <clears throat> I have an affinity for smaller churches. I, I As I told you, I accepted my call to ministry over uh, 42 years ago, matter of fact, this month uh, as a student at Lane College. And while a student there, <clears throat> I believe it was Reverend uh, Louis T. Perm, who's the presiding elder of the Jackson District of the East Tennessee Conference. He gave me two, two churches. One was Mount Zion CME Church in, in rural Gifford County. The other was uh, Chapel Grove CME Church in Fruitland, Tennessee. If you're not from Tennessee, you probably never heard of Fruitland. Uh, one church had about 14 or 15 members. The other one had about seven. I, 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 I said that to say this, people in rural churches uh, have an affinity for their church because it means something uh, to them. And if you remember, Skip, on your first 
uh, outing, I think the first or second, I was supposed to be on, but I was not on because I serve as the, uh, the leadership team leader for the uh, Shreveport district. Mm -hmm. And I advocate that we support all of our churches. Now, if you're not from the Louisiana region, <clears throat> you may have never heard of East Mission CME Church, uh, probably about five or 10 miles outside of Shreveport. That church was celebrating that Sunday and I didn't want to rush in and rush back. That church was celebrating 143 years. They right. probably have less than 40 members, but they have pride in those churches. Said all that to say this, and, and if the bishops are listening, just I hope they listen as I say it. I think sometimes bishops and presiding elders pull the trigger too fast on local churches. I say that because we need to get in to see that we have done everything that we can to make that church successful. Um, and, 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 and if, if we want to be really radical, and I hope people don't misunderstand me, sometimes we send new preachers to, to our rural churches. I wish there was some kind of way that we could send experienced pastors to those rural areas and support them financially uh, to give them our best to help them. Um, and, and before I answer the question about merging, and the other thing is, I say that we pull uh, uh, the we pull the veil too quick. The other thing is, and once we do this, Skip, we then go in and sell the properties of that church. And as a business student, and 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 started uh, doing some work in in in, uh, in home sales. We, we need to do more insight, uh, do more uh, 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 work in, uh, in, in looking at these churches. I think sometimes we sell these properties too fast because I've watched the trend. Now, there was a time when I was a little boy uh, and, and our church was in the rural. Uh, my pastor at that time was the late uh, uh, Reverend E.D. Hooks. And he saw that black folks were moving into the city where white folks would allow us to. And so he saw the trend and he moved Carolina Bluff into the city. Some of them didn't want to go, but all of them eventually went. Now Carolina Bluff is, I believe, 159 or something years old. Those people are still driving from the rural area into the town of Benton. Mm -hmm. Other people who live in Shreveport are driving 25 miles to Benton because they have a stake in that church. Uh, and so I, I, that's why I'm saying be careful. And then the other thing is now these areas that we are we call rural areas are now becoming suburban. When I grew up, a lot of those areas in Benton were cotton fields, cattle fields, etc. But now they are housing areas. And now the property that was probably worth a hundred dollars is worth a half a million. So I think we ought to be careful about pulling a uh, 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 the court too quick in closing churches, but then we also have to be reasonable. Now, if a church that cannot stand itself, cannot stand on its own, and they only down to two or three members, and but 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 don't force people. Talk to them, let them see that how it can be advantageous to them to go and join another church. Because if you force them, and it may not have a five members, but you're going to lose them because they don't want to give up that church. Right. You have to be careful right. in moving. But I think that when when the time, once we've done all we could and exhaust every avenue, then there are times when we need to merge churches for the betterment and the growth of those churches. Thank you. Thank you. Got a couple of more questions that I want to get uh, ask you. Let's talk about Africa for a second, because uh, mm -hmm. you very well could be elected and could be assigned to one of the Episcopal districts. Tell us about your thoughts and plans. Uh, any previous engagement with 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 uh, the 10th or 11th? Uh, and, and what? will you do if you are elected and assigned to Africa to engage and make sure that our brothers and sisters over there are fully engaged in all of the church uh, activities uh, and a part of everything that the church does? Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Skip. That's, that's a good question. And the thing is, I think our ministry in Africa 
for me, first of all, biblically speaking, is a part of that go you therefore. And, and, and now that we have churches and schools and seminaries, et cetera, set up in Africa, they are a part of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And I believe that they have the right to all the rights and privileges thereof. Now, I don't have a whole lot of experience uh, with Africa in, in terms of going over there. Uh, but if you, you notice that the, 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 um, the bishop of the 10th Episcopal District, Bishop Godwin uh, 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 Thompson Umorte, was a classmate of mine. And, and, and he had no idea, I had no idea that he would pass, but he had made preparation along with Bishop Carter for me to come and to visit. What I have done since I have not been able to travel to Africa, I know the importance of the work. Through Bishop Carter, my church, Lane Chapel, and myself personally, we have sponsored over the years uh, the salaries for pastors, uh, 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 for the mission supervisors. And since I don't have that experience, I'm not going to try to fake it. Mm -hmm. I will. I, I would bring people in, like Bishop Carter, Bishop Reddick, uh, 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 Bishop uh, uh, Snorton, uh, Jefferson Snorton, to help me, to assist me, to show me where I need to do and how I can be uh, uh, most effective in those areas. I think because they have the experience, and if we pull people in with resources and, and other people who've been there, and I think if we do that as a bishop, there's nothing wrong with a bishop asking for help. A bishop does not have to be completely efficient and perfect in everything, but he ought to have enough sense to put people around them to help us to be effective and serve the people of Africa and anywhere mm -hmm. the best that we can. All right. Thank you. And I would say he or she should he have a sense. Yes. That's right. That's yes. right. He or she. So let, let me ask yes. this. We're going into the general conference 14 days away. Yes, sir. You've seen the strategic plan. You read it, the legislative review, et cetera. Uh, you've heard the chitter and chatter. What, in your opinion, are the top three priorities that we must address at this general conference? Um, yes, I have read the um, uh, the um, strategic plan. Uh, I have I have not heard the um, epistle address yet. I heard you mention some things. Uh, that I had not, my bishop have not shared with us yet about that plan. I have read this strategic uh, plan, um, but I don't know if it will work for everybody. I think it's a good plan, but I think we need to do some things, some fine tuning to make it available to everybody. And I think it has to be, and I was also looking at that plan, uh, Brother Skip, mm -hmm. and I don't know if every part of it is measurable. Some of it is, is, is leap of faith and some things, but I have learned as a business major, hope is not a plan. Uh, uh, and then you have to fine tune plans to work uh, for everybody. I do have a couple of concerns about the uh, plan uh, because it wasn't clear to me. Uh, I think the plan says something about um, putting together uh, some tools for evangelism for the whole church. I, I didn't, and it wasn't an explanation in there as to how that was going to work with the general secretary of evangelism. Are they going to put that in over him or her or will it work in conjunction with that person? And if so, how would they talk to that person? I didn't see, I, I did hear brother Moore on, but, but there was no addressing in that. I, I think with that strategic plan, we need it because I'm a business student again. Uh, and one thing I learned brother Skip was 85% of success is a plan. The other 15% is working that plan. In order to do that, you must answer every question that people have. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a risky question or it may be a question or a plan that some people may not gather. If you teach people what you are trying to do and be honest and upfront with them, 
people may not fully understand now, but they will buy into the plan. I, I Overall, I can say I like the plan, but I do think we have to look at some, some plans, whether or not it's measurable, what are some things we can nail down to make it a little bit better, a little bit more palatable, but we indeed need to answer the, all the questions of the, of, of, the, uh, of the people in that. I think that's going to be one of the uh, uh, major things in, 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 the, uh, in the general conference as to the strategic plan and how we're going to make it work. So my, my last question to you, then what, what are the top three issues? If you had to pull just not, not, not so much a statement, but more so just a word, what are the top three issues you see as a pastor in this church for 40 something years and an aspirant that we have to address and solve? One, one of them is, try to solve, rather. thank you. Well, try to solve. One, one is, uh, I think on the top of everybody's mind is finances. Okay, finances. We, we, we have just come through. Uh, a pandemic. Okay. Uh, we've lost some folks in most of the churches, but in some of our churches, we've gained some people. Right. Uh, a lot of our churches are waning. Yeah. Um, and and they're looking at how they're going to uh, afford uh, uh, to pay their assessment, and sure. we need to pay our pay our assessment because that's how uh, we, our church keeps going uh, right. from top to bottom. So uh, finances is one. Give give me your two. So I can give you and time so, to make your closing statement. Okay, and so finances is one. I, I think the other is this, uh, Brother Skip. I think bishops are going to have to be more, I don't know how to say it, but uh, more open with people in in what we are doing okay. uh, uh, on the Episcopal level. Um, I, I, we, we're going to have to be more open and talk to people and make people feel comfortable uh, and not, please, Bishop, don't misunderstand me, and not act like kings. Okay. That's an issue that because people are getting upset because they don't feel like they're being respected. That's going to be one of the areas. That's another area. Uh, that The other, I think, we're going to have to deal with our young adults. Say what you will or may, however you want to take it. We're going to... We're going to have to make sure that our young adults are involved in the church. Uh, and we're going to have to lay out some plans to help them be involved uh, and let them be a, a part, even if we have to guide them for a while. You know, you don't you know, you, you may not be able to turn people completely loose. But those are some there are some others that I think will come up uh, uh, in the area. But I think those are three right now that we can deal with. And I think as bishop, we can have some influence and help in those areas. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate you addressing uh, those <clears throat> three topics. So what I like to do now uh, is to give you a couple of minutes to make your case. We have uh, delegates watching uh, from all over uh, our Zion uh, who have to make a decision uh, on who they're going to cast their vote. So I wanna give you time, a couple of minutes, please, if you would make your case as to why you are the candidate for this time and for this season for the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Thank you, Brother Skip. Uh, first of all, uh, um, as a candidate for, uh, for the, the Office of Bishop uh, in this 2022 General Conference, I bring 42 years uh, of experience, commitment, accountability, character, and uh, integrity. And I think we have some great bishops on the bench. I believe it's time for us to continue seasoned teamwork uh, together with innovative ideas, uh, thinking outside the box ministry that, that motivate our congregation, especially our children, youth, and, and young adults to become more involved, I believe, in a progressive and, and even radical ministry that will help propel our church forward as we respond uh, to God's call to go you therefore and to make disciples. I also believe, Brother Skip, that this present generation of children, youth, and young adults are still begging uh, the institution of church to open avenues that are relevant to their needs, to, to reach them in their orbit, to show them where we have been and where uh, we are heading in order to be relevant and, uh, and committed to Christ uh, in what they are are doing. Um, also, I'll end with this, Brother Skip. 
when I think of ministry and being a bishop, I think what goes for pastors sometimes can be used in the, the, uh, the Episcopacy. I, I, I'm reminded of the charge when I was uh, ordained an elder in, in the session of the Louisiana Annual Conference. I heard the bishop, uh, I believe Bishop Gilmore was the bishop at that time. He gave me a charge and it said, beloved, the call of Christ you have heard in your private examination and in the lessons from the Holy Scripture, both the gospel and epistle of the high dignity and the great importance of this office to which you are called. And once more, I exalt you. I exhort you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you remember how high and weighty the office is to which you are called. I mean, remember you are called to be messengers, watchmen, stewards of the Lord's family. Have always therefore in your remembrance how great a treasurer in, uh, is committed to your charge. For they unto whom you are to minister are the sheep of Christ and whom he gave his life. The church which you must serve is his bride and his body. And if you shall, and if it shall happen, the church or any member thereof, do take any hurt or hindrance because of your negligence. You know the greatness of the fall. That rings true to me as a pastor, and it rings true to me as a bishop. I don't want any person to take any hurt or harm because of my negligence. I remember the greatness of the fall. I ask you to consider me as one of the candidates. You have four, I'm hearing maybe five votes. I don't have to be 64. I can be 64, 65, 66, or even 67. God's blessings to each of you. I ask you to pray for me, and I ask for your vote. Thank you, Brother Skip. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm doing my own producing today. Uh, <laughs> let my guy take a break. But at any rate, thank you so much, Reverend Henderson. Uh, I appreciate your generosity of time and your engagement and questions. And of course, you can check his website out, www.hendersonforbishop.com. Uh, thank you so much. God bless you and your family. And good Lord willing, we'll see you uh, in Cincinnati in 14 days. Amen. That was Reverend Manuel Henderson. Um, and we are going to uh, bring up um, Reverend Denise Anders Modest. But before I do that, permit me uh, to share this video with you. What we need in times like these Faith, hope, and charity. What we need in times like these is someone who will lead us to victory. She has grace, she's poised, she has a love for the church, she has the leadership ability to make this. Well, we are so delighted to have Reverend Denise Anders Amadis with us. I got to admit, that's, that's, uh oh, make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Reverend Anders Amadis, can you hear me yes. okay? 
Okay, very good. We're so glad to yeah. have you with us. I got to admit, that's a very catchy tune. I, I found myself kind of rocking <laughs> to it as it was playing, but welcome to you. And first of all, how are you doing? Number one, uh, we certainly have been praying for you since the passing of your, your husband uh, and just hope that you are doing okay. Thank you, my brother, for your always continuous concern. Love you dearly. Thank you for what you're doing here. And let me tell you, that's not only a catchy tune, that is the truth. We need a modest touch and I'm ready. <laughs> well, tell us, Reverend Anders Modest, uh, about your desire, your decision to offer yourself as a candidate for this time and this season and why you are the one to be a part of that uh, College of Bishops and, and make a difference for this time. And we consider this to be your opening statement. Thank you for this opportunity for an opening statement. And let me answer your previous question, uh, Dr. Mason. I am doing well because of the undergirding of prayers from this church and across this uh, connectional church. I'm taking a moment at a time and trusting God in it. I am so delighted. Uh, let me get a caveat. <laughs> I just came out of two services. We had family and friends uh, day to day, both at uh, 10 and 2. And I still have some of the residue uh, up on me. So if I get a little jitty and happy and, and, and shouting and spiritual, uh, just charge it to my heart. Let me tell you something. In 1987, uh, when I accepted, no, when I accepted, not acknowledged my call, I was called at seven years old. I heard through a prophetic voice at nine years old that I was called to go preach the gospel. And I said the, 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 the most probably bizarre thing to God. I said to God when I accepted my call in 1987 in Richmond, Virginia, at the age of 25, I said to God, I haven't been through anything. I haven't experienced anything. My life has been sheltered. My life has been protected. My life has been uh, of great provisions. And so how can I preach God? How can I pastor? Well, can I tell you, it didn't take long after that conversation that God, and I know some of you have challenged my theological uh, precepts or concepts right now, but it didn't take long that I began to experience brokenness and poverty and eviction notice and unemployment. But I accepted my call to preach and to be a pastor. Let me hurry on. Unfortunately, I raised the same concern with God as I accepted the, and acknowledged the call to the Episcopacy. I said to God again, God, I don't know enough. I have not experienced enough to be a bishop to your people. Uh, but after four pastoral, uh, pastoral appointments, no, let me be real and transparent. After four difficult, somewhat difficult pastoral appointment, uh, they all came with their unique and different challenges and, and four years of terminal illness of my husband. I feel I bring sustainability. I feel that I bring transparency. I bring to this office my genuine self. I bring integrity to this office. Just as I believe God eight years ago, I believe him now. Eight years ago, I knew what God said, and I still know through every challenge that I experienced, every change I've gone through, every situation and every sorrow, I still know what God told me to do. Like many of you, I have wondered with myself if I was ready. Well, no, I'll take that back. After I Let me applaud the aspirants. After I heard your uh, uh, answers to all of these difficult questions, you, 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 have not struggled. Uh, you appear that you have not struggled before God with this. And uh, you seem to have all the right answers. And I go, God, I'm like the apostle Paul. I still see dimly. Uh, let me chase this rabbit on back home. What I'm simply saying, God has called me to this work. Through the many experiences that I've had, I truly believe that God has called me to this work. And that is that of a bishop.
can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now. Okay. All right. So let me begin. Thank you for that, that opening statement. So let's just jump right into it now. What do you see uh, as the three challenges? Same question I asked Reverend Henderson. What do you see as the three major challenges? There may be more, but I want to concentrate on the top three. You, you obviously read the strategic plan, the legislative uh, review and other things coming in as an aspirant, as a preacher, as a former presiding elder to this conference. What do you see as our major challenges and how do you propose to address them should you be elected uh, as a bishop? Thank you so much, Dr. Skip. And I, I think the strategic plan is an awesome instrument. It's a start. It's a beginning. It's It says, let's do something. It says that we're intentional about this church. But I see three things. My first, I raise the question, will this church be around for my great grandchildren? And when I say a be around, will this church be active and live and kingdom building? Will this church be making a difference in, in centuries to come? Will this church groom and grow persons to love God and love God's church? And so the first thing I see is growth. What are our growth potential? Are we at a place that we can grow or are we going to continue just maintain and do maintenance? Now there's nothing wrong with maintenance, but there ought to be some building and in, in maintenance. There ought to be some expansion in in, match, in, in, in uh, maintenance. That's the first thing is, will this church be around for my great grandchildren growth? Uh, and, and in terms of growth, I believe it can happen. I believe that as we intentionally and focus, uh, make it a priority at, as pastors and as a bishop, make us uh, growth. Numer numbers are not always uh the tell all however if god said in his word that the labels are few but my heart the harvest is plentiful that suggests to me that there's some people that we've got to go out there and those are physical numbers those are actual people and so i believe we must grow uh, physically but we must also grow spiritually and that we must make intentional efforts as a pastor in our first year in those churches to begin to expand and grow. My second, and let me hurry, that uh, how we invest our monies into the CME church communities. That's a priority to me. How we invest our monies into the CME church communities. I love, uh, we've got to teach our local church how to invest, how to have other means and streams of income. Our, our, our proposal, I wrote, uh, pro uh, not proposals, uh, for years for a city, uh, my home city, but we've got to go out there and get grant money. It's not enough to keep coming out of our pockets, especially if our memberships are dwindling. We have got to teach how to invest in monies. And I'll get in a lot of trouble but we've, when, when my girlfriends and others are not getting checks from that church, it bothers me how we're investing our monies in the community of the CME church. And here's my third one, and I'm rushing. I believe my priority is that we begin to create models of ministries and show them how, show others how to adapt. I hear so many good things about what people have done. Aspirants are talking about all that they've done in the past. And my first question is, well, why haven't you created a model of ministry so I can do that too? What? I have it in the local settings and the community, I mean, in our communities and our small churches so that we can do what you're doing and we can be great also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I like that models of ministry. So let's let's talk about uh, your plan for merging uh, and consolidating congregations that are struggling uh, as well, and having difficulty trying to make apportionments. What are your thoughts on it if you are elected uh, as a bishop? I, I I like the fact that we're just talking about it. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that apparently there's there is a problem, there is an issue, there is a concern, and it's rumbling in our crawl. So just the mere fact that that we've thought about merger as 
uh, an answer to uh, this problem. It could be uh, the fact that uh, financially we feel like we could we will do better. Uh, I believe that when we pull our resources, we have a rich bank of great leaders. And when we begin to pull and pull uh, these leadership teams, as we merge as churches, I believe we would be greater. I believe that everybody diff, especially if it was carefully planned, carefully thought through, carefully, uh, met, not just with the pastors, but bring everyone to the table, all of the community, all of the church members, so that everyone can have a buy-in. I think mergers could work, but I think if we see within a year or so after trying is not working, we don't stay in that place. I believe we go back to the drawing board and said, what's next? One it of could the improve the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't say this, but I do believe it could improve the, uh, the, the, uh, the operational of the church, uh, the efficiency of the, of the uh, church and stimulate new growth. As I talked about new growth, I really believe if we do it right, it could stimulate new growth. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Anders Modest. So a couple of issues that comes up, and I've asked the aspirants to give me your thoughts about young adults, okay, retaining youth and children, men uh, in the church, and, and lay. Sometimes lay, I've heard and I've read, they feel uh, very much omitted, you know, from the mainstream of planning, and the, we're not a church without the lay. So as a elected Episcopal leader, a bishop. Give me your thoughts on uh, retaining young adults, uh, uh, men, getting men back into the church. Uh, there's some discussion about ministry to men and it moving to the lay department. Will that hamper uh, the work that has been done? And, and then, of course, uh, just um, maintaining, you know, a good solid foundation with the lay of the church. I know that's a heavily loaded question, <laughs> but you take whatever you want to take from it and uh, respond to it, okay? Thank you, Dr. Skip Mason. That is a heavy loaded question, but let me tell you something. We've been dancing, we've been dancing and marinating that question for years, and I just <laughs> think that it's about time that we put the uh, our foots to the pedal and do something. Do something. Yeah. Let's do something. Uh, uh, the younger members of the church feel that they have no voice. Uh, they they have no voice within the church, and 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 that we're not bringing them to the table. Well, let's do that. That's the first thing we ought to do. Let's bring them to the table in all of our planning. Uh, let's make sure that their voice is heard, uh, and not put them on the back burner. Uh, let's show them our love for the church, our our genuine love for the church. They have witty inventions. They have great ideas. Uh, and, and so let's use them. And one of the avenues to do that through uh, is through one of my great love of ministry is Christian education and formation. Yeah, uh, John, Dr. Jonathan at uh, ITC says that it undergirds all the other ministries. And I think through those ministries, they're already set in place. But if through Christian education formation that we begin to involve more and utilize our, our youth, young adults, and uh, and 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 see <laughs> what salt they 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 are made of. These people are working with Fortune 500 companies. They're educators. Uh, they're leading the nation. So why not let them help us to lead the church? Thank you, thank you so much, Reverend Anders Modest. Talk a little bit uh, about your your thoughts on uh, multi year appointments. For pastors, one, and what do you do? How do you work with presiding elders uh, to uh, encourage pastors' physical, mental, spiritual, and financial health? Thank you, and I have done that throughout my ministry. Um, in terms of multiple churches, and I want to be very careful in, ter in, in terms of answering, because when I'm elected, I don't want you to say, you said, yeah, thank you. But I think uh, the use of multiple, um, uh, using pastors for multiple years is a great idea. However, I was brought up with the notion that bishops sit, sup, and listen to God in regards to pastoral appointments. And I wouldn't wanna lock anyone in if 
uh, we have assigned someone to a five year, seven year assignment and, and there needs to be a shift. But I think it's, it's the way to uh, a greater uh, growth for the church. Because if I had a father or mother that was in and out, and let me just be candid, if I shifted mothers and a, and a father every two years, every three years, it's going to be very difficult, one, for me to trust that father, that mother. I've got to learn new cultures. And I think longevity speaks volume to uh, what a pastor can do in a church once he or she began to learn uh, his or her people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Anders Modest, if you are elected, you may be assigned to the beautiful continent of Africa, uh, serving one of the Episcopal districts, the 10th or the 11th. Tell us about your relationship, your thoughts on our brothers and sisters there. Uh, what kind of bishop would you be and how would you help our uh, wonderful brothers and sisters throughout the continent to be totally engaged in the work of the CME Church? Dr. Basin, uh, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, when I took my first trip to Africa, I went to my saintly, now saintly grandmother, who I confide in, and she was a prayer warrior. I was afraid to go to Africa. I was afraid to fly across the country. She looked at me with those big eyes, and she simply said to me, same God. Same God in America, same God in Africa, same God here in Rust, Louisiana, same God. I believe it's the same God in Africa. I believe that I'm poised to be there if that's what uh, God uh, will allow. Being in Africa, there, there would be needs that uh, to, to be a, a reciprocal relationship with people. There would be something that we can learn. I believe that we can learn from each other together. And in fact, when I was there in Africa, my greatest learning lessons and teaching moments was while I was there on a scholarship for one whole month in Africa. Together, we, we have to learn to adapt uh, to the needs that they have. And, and, and truly understand their culture, uh, help them to develop economic well-being, uh, things that they can do to help themselves. I know the biggest uh, problem I would have is naturally the culture of uh, being led by a woman. So you see my heart just pity patting, but I believe that that same God, different continent, but that same God would help me and give me the vision to lead his people uh, to greater success. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response. Would you go back and talk about ministry to men and men in the church? Uh, we had someone who uh, asked that question, your thoughts on men and ministry to men uh, in the church. Uh, and what would you do to uh, engage and encourage more active participation uh, with the brothers in the Episcopal district that you might be serving? Thank you. And may I make a personal note? I want to thank this church. My husband loved ministry to men's ministry. And here at the Great Trinity CME Church, so many of you sent over 2,000 plus monies in donation to this local church in celebration of Reverend Mitchell Modest. I love to see men of valor. I love to put men to work in the church. And I strongly make an effort to seek out the gifts, the talents of men in the church. And I place them. The appointments are only for one year. And I like to place them in those places so I can uh, watch and observe. I think ministry to men is critical. In homes with single parents, Shout out for all the single parents, mothers who've done a tremendous job. I just believe that having uh, that male counterpart, that male person in the home would make a difference in the lives of our children, our church, our community, and our congregants. So I strongly, I strongly would seek out the gifts of men and make sure that it's highlighted and lifted. And thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is the bishop in the CME church the pastor's pastor? Why uh, or why not? I just knew you would you would raise that question with me. <laughs> I don't know if that's a trick question. I don't know if that's a technical question. I don't know if there's a wrong or right answer. But let me let me take this take on it. Uh, 
I can say from my own personal experiences, I can talk about without calling name my prior bishops who I look to for direction. I look to guide for guidance and confidence. Uh, Dr. Skip, even before I became a pastor, people came to me so much for counseling and coaching. So I know the great need of having someone to shepherd over you. And I, thus, I believe that um, while they may not be technically, I really want to believe in my heart that my bishop uh, would, would be considered my pastor, my place to go to, uh, and one who has uh, a guard and guide over the direction of my ministry. So then are you saying that you would be that kind of bishop? I am that kind of person already. I would be that kind of bishop. Yes, it takes a lot out of I would I want to be clear that I don't uh uh be in such a way that it impedes the growth of a pastor. Uh that that he or she looks to me always for answers without uh being able to uh critically think for themselves. But I love to think that uh I'm just a well I say a phone call away. Sometimes you can't reach me. But I love to think that pastors, preachers, ministers under my leadership can come to me and hear sound counseling. So, Thank yes, I would be. OK, wonderful. Thank you very much. So one of the primary responsibilities, Bishop Lakey makes it real clear, is for the bishop to make appointments. And so given that understanding, uh, and the fact you've served as a presiding elder as well, what would be your philosophy about making appointments to, to churches? Uh, this was one of the questions that has come up a number of times. So would you talk about your philosophy of making appointments to churches with pastors, putting the right pastor with the right church? And would you also consider retired pastors as well? Philosophy, I like that. <laughs> Thanks. All of my appointments have been what I call midnight appointments. When I finished seminary at Phillips School of Theology at the ITC, Bishop Thomas L. Hort Lanier Jr. said to me that he was gonna bring me back to my home district in Louisiana. So he had several places that he had in mind to send me uh, because I was seminary trained. But having talked to some of some of the members of the church, some of the pew pastors, I mean, I didn't say that. I mean, you know, some of the members of the church, uh, he found that it would probably not have been a good place to send me because it was my first appointment. It was my first time out of the saddle and from seminary. So he chose not to send me there. Then he had another place in mind. And because of Catholicism, and it was north down in, in South Louisiana. He thought that wouldn't be okay. And so at midnight in the annual conference, he had given me a location where I was going, but he had to backtrack, change his mind. I believe he got on his knees. I believe he prayed to God. And he sent me to my first charge, not on the map. Many people didn't know about them. But I tell you, when I left there, people were clamming, trying to get to Mount Sinai. I'm saying the name in Colleston, Louisiana, because of the impact that Reverend Denise Anders made on their lives and that community. I said all that to say, I do believe, I do believe that pastoral appointments by the bishop is important. Sometimes we'll miss it. But I believe it's 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 critical to the life of the church in in uh conjunction with their presiding elders. Now, I also believe that the bishop needs to have been there for a while so that he or she can uh, can observe the churches, can observe the leadership and the skills of a pastor before making a quick appointment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Let's talk a minute about growing churches. We talked about merging and consolidating, but church growing churches, winning salt and, and planning new churches. What are your thoughts uh, on that? 
um, as a Episcopal leader? I think what Jesus was saying in his text message to those boys and in, in, uh, Matthew, when he told them, go ye therefore, teach all nations, I believe he was setting up a pattern for growth for uh, Christianity, for the church. And so the, the first thing I believe is that a teaching church is a growing church. A teaching church is a growing church. I believe when you teach solid doctrine, when you teach the word of God, the church will grow. Uh, the, the, uh, the, what, each one will reach one. Somebody will go out and talk about uh, what's happening in your local church. I could go on and on with that, but I strongly believe that churches can grow uh, through the teaching ministry of Jesus the Christ. Thank you. And what I'm going to do, I have one final question for you. Then I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, to make your closing case uh, to all of the delegates who are watching uh, and uh, those who are uh, looking to, to make their, their decision. Obviously, COVID-19, the pandemic changed a lot about our church, particularly with worship uh, and doing church differently. Uh, as our Georgia lay leader, uh, Brother Grant Lewis, likes to say, the church has left the building. What what do you suggest to offer uh, as we go forward after this general conference and how we do church as the CME church? Do we return back to the norm? Uh, are there some other thoughts and ways that we accomplish the same goals, and that is to preach the gospel. So give us some thoughts, uh, Reverend Andrew, uh, Anders Modis, as to what you foresee for the future of our church uh, in the middle of the pandemic and post-pandemic. I said in the middle of the pandemic that we can't do church as usual. And, and, and we had to learn that the hard way we could not do, we had to go to hybrid church. We had to do so many creative ways uh, to do ministry. And, and you, but you tell me you want change, but you keep doing things the same way. You tell me you want change, but you keep doing that. We have to do it differently. We have to do it differently. We have to find ways that have been proven and work. We have to take risk. We have to take chances uh, in, in the church. Uh, the church is not, in my eyes, through this pandemic and post, has not been essential. What are you talking about? People still went to Walmart. They went to the supermarket. They went to TJ Maxx. They went to Steinmark. People still got out. But when it came to coming back to the physical church, people would not come. It suggests to me that there was nothing essential or they felt essential enough in the church when they were there prior to the pandemic to risk their lives for. But they went and got that egg, milk, and bacon because they knew it sustained their life. We've got to do sustaining life ministries. We've got to do things different. And it may be that we have to begin to look at a more localized, okay, I'm gonna, don't throw the rocks. I love the connectional church. But it may be that we've got to begin to do more localized ministry. What are you talking about? One-stop shop places, Walmart. I get everything I want there. It may be that we've got to start focusing on families who don't want to move around every Saturday, every week to different places, but they want to be fed right where they are. I think the pandemic was just a, a finale of a, 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 a instrument that came down perhaps from heaven to shake us and to awaken us to what the church ought to be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to uh, ask you to take the next couple of minutes to make your closing statement, your closing argument to our delegates who are watching uh, and those who are interested in our church as to why Reverend Denise Anders Modis uh, is the one to be elected for the College of Bishops for this season uh, and for this time. Thank you. The hallmark 
of my entire ministry, 30 plus years of ministry, has been to motivate congregations, community, congregants in stewardship, discipleship, and spirit-filled worship. Uh, that has it has worked for me. I believe I'm I'm ready. I believe that I'm ready to lead the church. She's been my sweetheart uh, for ye, all of my life. And I'm committed to touching lives. That touch, the modest touch, that's not just a, a song that sounds good. I believe that transforming others will unite the church, the congregation, and the community in holistic ministry. I do believe that. I believe that it will stabilize. I believe that it will build a great agenda in, in equalities. Uh, I believe healthy churches will grow as a result of just the touch. If, and, and I can do that. I have proven a leadership for pastoral appointments. And they all have been successful both in growth and financial uh, and spiritual growth. I want to take this time to thank this church for all that you do, for your support, for allowing this kind of a Sunday evening for us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Skip Mason and others for affording us this opportunity to let the church see who we are. Thank you for understanding uh, my last four years that have, has been difficult, but only to make me stronger and to only to have gone through these experiences, I know I could bishop anyone for that matter. And I believe that I can bring this church to greater heights with the help of God. Thank you again. God bless you. God bless you. And thank you, Reverend Denise Anders Matas, an aspirant for the Episcopacy of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. We pray God's blessings on you. Uh, in these next two weeks as we march to Cincinnati. Look forward to seeing you there, God willing, uh, and continued blessings to you and all of the aspirants for what you all have had to endure and what you're going through as we get there. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time. Uh, and God bless you and see you in a couple Thank of weeks. And let me shout out to the commissioners. Thank you so much for your prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That was Reverend Denise Anders Amadis, uh, and we appreciate uh, her time and her response to the questions. Uh, again, uh, we have two more aspirants, so if you need to uh, take a, a bio break, uh, go get you some uh, tea or coffee. We have two more wonderful aspirants that I'm going to be bringing to you, uh, and I am prepared now to bring the uh, next um, aspirant uh, up but I'm going to uh, start with uh, this video. Greetings, family. I thank God for you. I praise God that you're here. Welcome to the Washington for Bishop 2022 Facebook page. This page will provide inspiration, information, and motivation. I ask that you visit it frequently to find out about campaign activities, events, and opportunities to support me and my aspirations for Bishop in 2022. I'm excited about what God has in store for the Seaman Church and its members. We've come through some hard times. We've faced some tremendous foes. We've stood against some giants, and God has always provided us with victory after victory. We continue to strive to do our best, to reach our greatest potential, but God has always been at His best. He's always given us His best, and it's by following the Spirit of the Lord that we'll always overcome every obstacle. This is a crucial time in the life of the church. We are facing some major issues in and outside our walls. Issues that are crucial to our growth, to our congregations, and to all of humanity. The Seaman Church is gifted and powerful, and I believe that God has equipped us for such a time as this. I believe that God has equipped me for such a time as this. For the next few months, I invite you to journey with me as we make our way to Cincinnati, Ohio for the 39th Quadrennial Session and the 40th convening of the General Conference of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Journey with me as we engage, empower, and enlarge members and all of humanity in order to have a stronger church and a stronger relationship with God. Now let me acknowledge and thank God for those who've gone on to be with the Lord that made the senior church vibrant and relevant. 
Let me thank you for your faithfulness and the sacrifices that you have made to ensure that the church is alive and well. And I know that it has not been easy, especially over the last couple of years. I also want to take this moment to, to, to thank God for the amazing Washington Division 2022, 2022 campaign, campaign team. Campaign. For the campaign manager, for Reverend Zachary Williams, Reverend my family, Zachary and my beautiful bride, Dr. Landry Bird Washington. Now again, I thank you. And I'm looking forward to serving the church and you, working with you as we engage in power and in laws the body of Christ. Family, let's do this. Let's let's make it happen. Washington for Bishop in 2022. I won't let the church down. I won't let you down. Blessings to you and to yours. And again, and again, welcome. welcome. Well, thank you. We are blessed to have uh, Reverend Dr. Philip Washington, uh, who's a presiding elder and pastor, but for this occasion, an aspirant for the Episcopacy. Welcome, Dr. Washington. Unmute yourself. As, unmute yourself, Dr. Washington. There we go. There you go. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mason. I appreciate you. And thank you for this opportunity. It's good to see you and to see this ministry that has continued to grow and blossom into a great ministry. And again, just thank God for your ministry, sir. Well, God bless you and thank you. Well, we're going to jump right into it. Dr. Washington, you got to tell the folks right now why you and why now for this season uh, in our church. Uh, and this will be your opening statement. Dr. Mason, I want to just thank you for this opportunity again. To answer the question why. The Spirit of the Lord has been preparing me throughout my ministry for now. And I asked myself and the Spirit why? Why now? And the Spirit allowed me to look back over my ministry over 40 years of the challenges I faced and how God brought me through each of them. I realized I was being prepared for now. Now has been coming for a long time. My ministry started many years ago as an assistant to my father, the late Reverend Lester Washington. My father was a hard worker, a man of integrity, a bivocational pastor. He taught me and my brothers that a man's word is important, that family is important. And in order to keep the first two, you need to have a right relationship with God. And as a young minister, I learned about pastoral relationships. I also learned the importance of being a Christian leader, because there's a difference between being a Christian leader and being a leader. I continue to develop a close relationship with God, being led by the Spirit. I matured. I grew spiritually, and through experiences, I became wiser. And I look at all of that and realize that I was being prepared for now. I look back upon those days, remembering working with Christian education, lay and missionary leaders, leaders who took time with me to explain the policies and procedures and how to apply them. I was mentored by pastors of both small and large congregations who took time to share with me the challenges of the church and pastoring. I remember Bishop P. Randolph Shah, Kirkendall, Murchison, Coles, Isom, and Graves, how they presided over meetings and ensured that discipline was being followed, how they related to the members and pastors of each congregation, of each conference. I was being prepared for now. My first official charge was 188 miles away from my home, the St. James Seamy Church in Leavenworth, Kansas, being encouraged to go to Phillips School of Theology. And while there, I passed the circuit churches, learning that the rural church has a unique set of challenges. All of these experiences helped to shape and form my Christian leadership. It helped me to understand my now. These experiences helped to build leadership capacities and characters and allowed me to serve with a greater depth across our Zion. Every church that I've pastored, both small and large, I've been able to grow spiritually, financially, and numerically. God has blessed me to be able to take a congregation to new levels of ministry and impact, empower young adults to take on critical leadership roles in our churches. Being appointed by Bishop Paul A.G. Stewart Sr. and Bishop Sylvester Williams Sr. as presiding elder of the Detroit and the Michigan districts, I've served now for 14 years and have been able to meet the challenges that have came inside our church and the pressures that came against us from outside our church. Working both with seasoned and first-time pastors, empowering them to reach their goals, both ministerial and personal, breaking down barriers between clergy and lay, and ensuring that our district will continue to strive even though we face many challenges a recession where here in Michigan, we were at ground zero. Through a water contamination in Flint and the global pandemic, God has blessed us that we have continued to move forward and thrive in these conditions. I thank God that he gave me what I needed to serve as a spiritual leader and be effective in guiding our congregations. From Battle Creek to Lansing, to Jackson, to Detroit, to Flint, to Saginaw, 
the CME Church is strong, engaged and making an impact in the lives of its members and its communities. My focus on building strong partnerships outside the walls of the church also enhances my now. Over my tenure, I've raised millions of dollars to support citywide educational programs for thousands of children. I've launched the, launched the Child Savings Account Ministry that supported low-income families in saving for their children's education and formed partnerships that have blessed our congregations in being responsible for a budget of over $3 million in goods and services. Lastly, God has blessed me to serve on every level of the church, locally, regionally, and collectively, and connectionally. I have been on the chair of the Joint Board of Finance, chair of the Economic Development Committee, program director for the 30 Fiscal District. Connectionally, I have served on the general board. I'm a former vice chair of both personnel services and the Christian Board of Education and Formation, and served on the Committee on Episcopacy. I believe all of these experiences have taught me, shaped me, and taken me to a new level of leadership that will be a valuable asset to the College of Bishops that brings me to now. I believe I've been prepared for now. Every moment in my life has led to now. I believe it's my now. Can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Hear you now. Okay, my apologies. So as we are 14 days away from the general conference, what do you see, in your opinion, are the three major challenges of our church? And I, I preface this by the information that we've shared, uh, that has been shared, the strategic plan, the legislative review. But from your own observation as a seasoned pastor uh, and as a presiding elder, what do you foresee are the three major issues that we go into this general conference? Uh, and how do you propose as a Episcopal leader to address some of the issues that we're currently facing now? Thank you for this critical question. Number one would be strengthening our unity as a body. Number two, addressing church decline. And number three, enlarging our territory. We must strengthen our unity as the body of Christ and build on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. We're to be making disciples for Christ, not for one another, not clones. I believe we must become deeply rooted and grounded in the word, strengthen our relationships with bishops, pastors, congregations, lay and clergy, so that we understand that we are our brothers and sisters keepers, that our success is all of our success, that we are one body with many parts, and God has created and designed every part, and every part is essential to the success of the body. We should not be in competition with one another, but we should be in tight connection relationship with each other. This means preparing pastors and spiritual leaders for the work ahead. The strategic plan helps us to collectively guide us and strengthen our work. This brings us opportunity to think about new ways of collectively preparing and training pastors and leaders to help actualize the goals of the strategic plan. I can envision actual training sessions across the area of the, strategic, of the strategic plan, building curriculums that can be offered to our Episcopal regions and our churches to learn together and not only understand the what, but the how. When we create these opportunities to come together and learn together and grow together, it creates a direction, alignment, and commitment across the whole denomination and unifies us as strong with CMEs. Secondly, church decline. This has been an issue that is the center of our conversation across the connection, not only our connection, but across all Christian world. We know we'll need to make some tough choices related to church decline, church growth, and mergers. I believe this is an issue that will require authentic engagement with our churches to have these challenging conversations and make decisions on charting a path forward. To merge churches is not easy, but in some cases, it may be the answer. I believe we need to continue to grow and expand our training and development of our congregations about evangelism to help them better understand evangelism in the 21st century. Part of our history is that we were strong advocates of educating our people in social justice. Our churches grew because of our involvement in education and social justice platforms. We marched for freedom, better jobs, racial justice, and equality. So how do we integrate and learn from our past in this new model of evangelism as we seek to reach the masses? There's a real opportunity for our churches to examine their relevancy in the communities in which they sit. How do we begin to equip our churches and our pastors, our leaders, to understand the needs of the communities in this change in demographics and the type of ministries that can both serve community and join in new members? Research on church growth 
especially in the black church, tells us that forming ministries and addressing needs of those both inside and outside the walls of the church leads to greater church growth. I think it's time that we turn our connectional efforts in equipping and supporting churches to build their capacity for relevant ministries. As we think about church growth, we have to continue to seriously grapple with the decline of youth and young adults in our congregations. This is where ministry and church growth intersect by building out intentional strategies to increase the demographic of our church. We know that while young adults aged 18 to 29 make up 22% of the U.S. adult population, they represent less than 10% of church goers. Prayerfully, as your next bishop in the senior church, I'd like to see us work with our youth and young adult leaders across the connection to create a national campaign of church growth explicitly focused on youth and young adult population. I believe this could redirect and this decline and perfectly build a generational pipeline for young families coming back to the senior church. Lastly, lastly, as we emerge out of this pandemic to our next normal, where do we see ourselves as a global imprint? We must enlarge our territory. There are so many untapped spaces that we could leverage our denomination. And I'm not saying we need to be in every space, but we need to make sure that we do more than just be in our churches on Sunday morning and be visible in every corner of the world, visible in the lives of members, the lives of our communities, in the lives of our nation and other nations. The CME Church is strong and we need to make sure that others know about the assets and the possibilities that we are a strong CME Church. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And speaking of uh, enlarging our territories, would you talk about um, Africa? Um, and it's a possibility if you're elected, you might be assigned to one of the Episcopal districts. Give us your thoughts. Uh, because our brothers and sisters from Africa are watching as they do faithfully, and I'm so grateful and appreciative. But give us your thoughts about what kind of bishop would you be over uh, in the 10th or 11th Episcopal District and how you would engage uh, them in the mainstream of activities with the CME Church. Thank you again for the question. Like many of our members and pastors, I have not had the privilege to visit our work in Africa. However, I and my districts have been strong supporters of the work in Africa. We contribute several ways to the work in both the 10th and 11th Episcopal District on a yearly basis. It is imperative that we empower the people in Africa. I believe that we have an opportunity to move this from a mission work to the African churches being self-sustainable. Of course, it's gonna take time, resources, training to develop African brothers and sisters across the African diaspora. I believe with the right resources and training, our CME churches in Africa will allow them to become strong and effective churches in the African community, enriching the lives of the people of Africa, strengthening their relationship with God and their responsibility to the church. As we think about the future of our church, its global impact, and its influence, we must ask ourselves, are we ready to make a shift from mission to sustainability? And I believe we're ready. I believe they are ready. Dr. Washington, thank you. Would you talk about uh, your thoughts on, and you alluded to it in your, um, and you identified um, enlarging our te uh, 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 territory, uh, but church decline. And, and so what does the future of the CME church look like in terms of, of church growth? And, and, and what formal model or plan must we put in place? And what would you do as a bishop? Uh, as an Episcopal leader to ensure that our churches are viable and are growing? I believe the strategic plan is a good start. And what is in the plan aligns in my overall thinking for spiritual, social, and financial growth of our churches. I focus on stewardship, evangelism, church growth, spiritual growth, and both clergy and lay are critically important to, the Bible, to, to be a vibrant denomination. Preferably when you elect me as the next bishop, I'll work on building a solid infrastructure that will guide us toward transformational shifts that we'll need to in order to see the changes we desire. It's one thing to develop a plan, but it's a whole nother matter to execute the plan. With that said, I'd like to lift up two areas. I'll work hard to you to see us deepen our efforts on ensuring that pastors and churches have accessibility to cutting edge training and develop to equip them for 21st century ministry and kingdom building. Life is different because of this pandemic and we are facing a new normal. 
We must equip our pastors to be successful in church growth and development with the understanding that they are now in a hybrid model of ministry. Now we must pivot our skill set that we may already have acquired to do ministry and engage people wherever they are and prepare them for a new model of church growth, church budgeting, church membership, and church financial stability. Secondly, I think it's imperative that we hone in on being implicit about financial growth on both connectional and local levels. There are opportunities to look at how we invest the resources we already have for greater financial growth and sustainability. Now is the time we should start thinking about growing a CME endowment that will help to build a corpus of funds that will help us to support and sustain our mission and the work of the church. We have an opportunity to look at how we can invest resources which can help address the struggle we have with conference claims and providing operating resources for the churches on the connectional level. We've got to leverage our CME Foundation designation to raise funds throughout foundations, grants, government funding, and other types of donations to support the work of and outreach of our ministries. Throughout my ministry and leadership, I've seen the power and impact of leveraging these types of funding streams. It's not a cakewalk, but it's with right infrastructure in place we can do it. We know that our tithes and offerings will not solely sustain the type of ministries our churches may desire to implement. We must position ourselves, our churches, to gain greater access to the resources for the work ahead of us. Through community block grants and other resources, we can get it done. That will help us to address this, this decline of church growth. When we become involved in the members' lives and in the community's lives, they will see the importance of being a part of the church. Thank you, Dr. Washington. I've asked this to all of the aspirants. I'm going to ask you, as the bishop in the CME Church, the pastor's pastor, why or why? Look at you wiping the <laughs> <laughs> give, give us your thoughts on this, please, sir. I, I've heard several thoughts about this. A bishop is a spiritual leader, not simply a CEO. A bishop becomes a bishop because of his or her relationship with God and his people. The root purpose of a bishop is to provide spiritual leadership. The bishop represents not only his or her position, but the bishop represents the position of God that he imputes in his spirit and his understanding of it. A bishop, without a doubt, is a pastor not only to the pastors, but to the entire Episcopal district. Where can a preacher or presiding elder go when he or she is in need of spiritual leadership, spiritual guidance? When I was younger, I saw the bishop as the chief pastor who was given a vision by God to share with the presiding elders, the pastors, and the members, who in turn shared that vision with others. And then it brought about church growth. The vision was not simply for the church and its members, but for all the world to see, and then to change, to repent, and to turn to God, and to come and join the body of Christ. For a person to see or to view the bishop is not a pastor to say that there's a disconnect between the bishop and the people a disconnect that resolves the bishop from having any spiritual responsibility, a disconnect that justifies the bishop to only see the people as a means to an end, a disconnect that prevents the bishop from understanding that he or she has a responsibility to God to care for the souls of the people. The result of a bishop not being a pastor, I believe, would be devastating and detrimental to the growth of the church. I believe a bishop is first and foremost a spiritual leader and understand the word of Jesus Christ when he says, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd who owns the sheep, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and flees because he is a hireling and doesn't care for the sheep. A bishop is a good shepherd. A bishop is a pastor. Thank you. Dr. Washington, do you believe in multiple year appointments? Um, and Talk a little bit about, and you might have alluded to it, um, your philosophy as it relates to pastors and appointments. And obviously, you're a presiding elder, so you've already been engaged in making recommendations to your Episcopal leader. But as a bishop, uh, when it comes to, to appointments, uh, just kind of share your thoughts uh, on what kind of a bishop you would be as it relates to that. Thank you again for the question. Again, I've heard many thoughts about this and I've had time to think it through a little bit more than I normally would have. I believe making appointments is one of the most important responsibilities of a bishop and should be entered into prayerfully with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
it's not just about pairing congregations and pastors. Making appointments has several factors. It includes the fit with the district, the annual conference, and with the communities. Even though presiding elders give recommendations to bishops, the bishop has a responsibility in providing each congregation and district with Christian leadership that will empower its members to live Christian lives. When making appointments, bishop has to look at building a strong and effective team that can accomplish the vision. And that an appointment should be a good fit with the presiding elder or the pastors and the other conference. Each appointment enhances not only the congregation, but should be an asset to the district, which in turn will bless the annual conference. Making appointments entail knowing the pastor's strengths and weaknesses. Bishops must understand the community, the church, the culture, and the people. Appointments should be also challenge the pastor and congregations. Pastors should not be assigned just to keep the status quo, but be able to keep the congregation moving forward. Appointments should be made with a long range goal in mind. In essence, when making appointments, the bishop has to consider the pastor's family, the fit and health of the growth of the church, its impact upon the members, and their responsibility to the church and to the annual conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't think we've touched on uh, with any, any uh, depth ministry to men. Um, and what are your thoughts on it as it relates to empowering men and retaining men and the necessity for uh, this important ministry. And while we're talking about that, we're also looking at young adults. I did hear you reference it uh, in a couple of points. Uh, and of course, the lay, which consists of all, but we've had questions to come up about uh, lay. Some lay people feel that they're overlooked, that they are not engaged in the process. So, you know, pick and choose what you want from that. But we're looking at ministry to men, young adults and lay and how you will manage that as uh, an Episcopal leader uh, in our church. Let me address the uh, ministry to men first. We are expecting men to come to the church. And therefore, I think we have to look at it a different perspective. We have to go to where they are, not just the men, but also youth and young adults, where they are and become involved in their lives to where they have a desire to come to the church. We've got to make an impact on where they are. If they're on a golf course, if they're at a ball game, wherever the men are, we've got to go to where they are and begin to talk about Jesus Christ, to talk about how God has affected our lives, where he's brought us from, so that they desire to have a right relationship with God. If we're just going and saying, come to church, it's not going to work. We have to show them and demonstrate them what God has done in our lives, how it's empowered us, and how it has helped us to grow as men, and even as youth and young adults, how it can be better meant to our lives, our families, our children, how being a part of the body of Christ can help us to grow. So my belief is, first of all, we have to go to where they are, not expect them to come to the church. Go to where they are. We have men in our churches that uh, have relationships with other men that will be able to help them to see what God has done. Get a group of men together. In, in the city of Detroit, uh, we have what we have, uh, Halloween. On oh, Halloween, it's called like where we were. A lot of fires and stuff would be started. So what took place is we got a lot of men together that were in the community and in the church. And we walked through the neighborhood, a predominantly black neighborhood where in which many of the fires were being started. And our presence there caused the fires to go down because we were there walking in the neighborhood, being led by men inside the church and outside the church. They are men and youth and young adults that are prepared and ready to work. They're looking for what is honest and true. People who are what they say they are. And if we are the church that God has called us out to be, we have power and influence that will cause people to want to join and become a part of the body of Christ. So we must go to where they are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my last question to you, and then I'm going to give you some time to make your closing statement uh, and to share those things that you want to share. Uh, we, we've talked about church planting. Uh, and you've alluded to, to, to church growth, but is the future of our church dependent uh, upon that? Uh, and if so, how important will that be to you uh, as an elected bishop of the church, church planning uh, and church growth? 
the future of our church, I believe, is based upon our church being able to provide ministries that will affect the lives of men, women, boys, and girls. Our church growth is going to be different from what from what it used to be. It's going to be a new a new way of measuring church growth. We are now in a hybrid situation, so therefore we must be able to provide ministries outside the walls of the church that will cause people to desire to become Christians. That means we must begin to access funding and partnerships with other agencies to be influential to help to bring persons to the body of Christ. Our church growth is not simply about coming in on Sunday morning and having a good time. We must be intentional in being a part of the lives of members and those outside the walls of the church, being influential, helping them to understand who they are and whose they are. Once we're able to interact in the lives of people, youth, young adults, men, women, everywhere, enlarging our territory, helping them to see who they are and how they can grow spiritually. We'll be able to grow the church and not simply call the church as the, a, a physical building, but the church is no longer looked upon as just a physical building. We have to utilize the resources outside the walls of the church to do ministry. Again, ministry is how the church is going to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question came up, what, what kind of bishop will you be, Dr. Washington? I know that's a wide and open question, but I, I think I do understand the, sin, uh, the sincerity of that question. What kind of bishop will you be? I will be a bishop that will engage both clergy and lay. A bishop that will listen, and not only listen, but hear the concerns of the people. And then also work toward a solution because there's a difference between hearing and then working toward a solution. I have been known to move from problem to the solution. I'll be a bishop that is concerned about every church and every pastor. I believe every member, every church, every pastor matters, no matter how large or how small, they're important. I'll be a bishop that will provide strong leadership because we are facing some turbulent times. And we need strong leadership that will be able to stand when others come against us and try to get us to change our ways and our views. I'll be a bishop that is compassionate, a bishop that understands and is able to provide resources to help each congregation move forward. I'll be a bishop that takes thank into consideration. Me. I'm sorry. That's I, Thank you. No, go. Okay. Thank you. And you've, you've kind of alluded to my final, um, not question, but giving you the opportunity to make your closing uh, statement. Uh, and so I'm going to throw it back to you. Take a couple of minutes to close out because there are delegates who are watching uh, and others who will cast a vote. Uh, and so make your final case as to why you, Dr. Philip Washington, uh, is the right choice for the right time in this season uh, of our church. Our church has made it through some turbulent times and we've been able to overcome them all through strong spiritual leadership. And now as we're facing more challenges, the church needs tested and proven leadership. Not just leadership that's talked about what we will do, but leadership that has already overcome and is ready for the next set of challenges. Leadership that is effective, purposeful and inspirational. Mature leadership. Leadership that is guided by the spirit of the Lord. I am that leader. I'm not asking you to elect me based upon friendship or popularity, but on my record of strong, proven spiritual leadership. Leadership that brought us growth in every congregation, a district, and even on the annual conference level. Leadership that has allowed me, a CME pastor, to be invited to the Congress to pray in this nation's capital. Leadership that is inclusive, Leadership that includes working with pastors and laity. Leadership that includes accountability, compassion. Leadership that is resourceful and innovative. I am one who gets results. I am prepared and ready on day one to go to work. I am that bishop. I'm asking you to elect me as the 64th bishop in the CME Church. And together, by the help of the Lord, we'll be given victory after victory. We'll be a vibrant witness. Reclaim the lost and enlarge our territory through life-changing ministry. Engage, empower, and enlarge. 
I'm looking forward to working with you. I love God and God's people. My ministry is steeped in Methodism. I know and love the Methodist church, its policies and its administrative style. It's the church of my parents and my ancestors. I've been blessed by the Simi church. My desire to serve the Simi church on its highest level is not based upon what the church can do for me, but what I can do for the church. I will serve you and the church with integrity and honesty. I will do my best to uphold the spiritual standards that God has set in his word. I will abide by the discipline of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. I will diligently carry out the work of bishop without prejudice and with what's best for the church always in mind. I believe I was not only called for such a time as this, but prepared for such a time as this. I am the Reverend Dr. Philip D. Washington, and I'm asking you to elect me as the 64th bishop in our great Zion. Thank you again for this opportunity and for the ministry that you're doing. It has been a blessing to me and to all of us. Thank you, Dr. Skip. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. Um, God bless you and your family. Uh, I know this has been a journey for all of you. Uh, and I pray God's blessings over these next two weeks. Uh, yeah. And I look forward to uh, seeing you uh, in Cincinnati. I got to share also that on this coming Tuesday, uh, I will be one of the guest uh, preachers or revivalists for the Juneteenth revival uh, on Facebook. So uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, turn in. I'm between Reverend Collins and Bishop Lakey. Uh, so if I don't say it, God knows one of them will say it. But thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation to share uh, and continue blessings to you and your family. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. That was the Reverend Dr. Philip Washington uh, who is an aspirant uh, for the Episcopacy, uh, and you've seen his uh, website, uh, of course, strolling. Uh, I am so delighted now to bring up, certainly last but not least, uh, the Reverend Dr. Wayne A. Williams, a, a friend to everybody and a friend to this CME church. Thank you, uh, sir. Well, good to see you, Wayne. God bless Thank you. you. Thank and, you, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So, so we're gonna jump right into the fire, Wayne. Why okay. you? Why you? Why now? As a bishop for our church, take some time to give us your your opening statement. Then we'll come back and we'll ask some questions. Okay. Well, I want to let you know how much I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Skip, uh, that you have given us, but it was really through the College of Bishops because I have sense enough to know in all of us that this program, uh, this platform would not continue without the support of the College of Bishops. So I'm grateful that the College of Bishops. Uh, amen on that. <laughs> okay, I'm grateful that the College of Bishops have given you this platform because I've been around this church a long time. And for you to pick up the mantle and present it for, to so many people that need to hear our story. I'm Wayne Williams, and I believe in this thing called experience. Experience is everything, everything. I've been around this church for 44 years in connectional ministry, and I have in the connectional ministry. What I mean, in 1976, I started with the last youth conference in in the history of our church in Memphis, Tennessee, at the Holiday Inn Rivermont on Rivermont Drive in Memphis. And from there, we went on then to the first youth and young adult conference where we struggled together. The young adults out there know who I'm talking about. We struggled together to try to frame, if you will, the Constitution. And of course, it was strengthened ever since then. But I've been a part of this church since then. I've been president, as you know, of the connectional, the third president of the connectional young adult of the CME church. First one was Ike Hentrell and Ronald Walker, and the third and fourth. I was the first in history to be elected twice by my peers, not selected, but elected. And, excuse me, and because of that, uh, we were able to have the young adult logo that they're enjoying today that came under my administration and so many other things as it relates to young adult work. But anyway, uh, back to my pastoral ministry, over 30 years plus, uh, I have served as 
of the administrative assistant to six bishops, bishop, the bishops Joseph Johnson and Paul Stewart and Thomas Lenoir Jr. and Thomas Brown and, and uh, C. James King. Um, and if you know, all of these persons have unique personalities and it takes a lot to work with people, but I served as a servant even with the different personalities. Bishop uh, Chester Arthur Kirkendall used to say to me, be loyal to the royal that is within you. And that's exactly what I have been. Uh, I believe that this is my time. I've given my life to the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. I've been a servant leader through the years, pastoring small churches, medium churches, and large churches, serving on the Joint Board of Finance for years in the Carolina region and chair of, of those uh, wonderful people have helped me with so many things. And, and when it comes down to uh, a servant leadership, I've served uh, as chair of transportation. And well, most of you know on here, and I won't continue to elaborate on that, but I have sent you my life journey. Every delegate and every alternate here, I've sent you my timeline. And that is my life. And I believe with all of that said, and all of the opportunities and chair of, the, of various boards and being on various boards and pastoring churches, I believe that in such a time as this, that I would be one of the bishops that would help servant leadership. Servant leadership is important. Don't let the smile fool you. Servant leadership is very important, but yet have a compassionate heart. So I believe that this is my time and this is my season. God bless you. You're muted, and you're muted. Thank you so much. Thank you for your opening statement. Now, going into the uh, general conference, what are the three major issues that we have to address at, as a church? And, and if you are elected bishop, how are you going to address some of the issues that we currently are facing? Uh, I think that's a great question, Skip. Uh, first and foremost of all, I share the sentiment of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. First and foremost of all, I believe in this leveraging technology. We're going to have to. We can no longer do business as usual. And one of the things that the uh, strategic plan shared with us is that we have to find creative ways to do ministry now. We can no longer just have, say that we can have service inside and then that's it. No, we need that hybrid ministry. We clearly have it in my district where I'm presiding elder of, where I've been, and also at the Lynch Street Semi Church in Jackson. The days of saying that strictly in-person service are over. The excuses are pulled away now. And one thing this pandemic has helped us with is to eradicate the excuses, even in church conferences. Well, I missed the church conference today. I'm sorry. No, that's not quite true, my brothers and my sisters, because now we have screens up doing with the Zoom information. And if you need to raise your hand, we have the audio visual team that will let me know when you raise your hand and they can see you and you can see us and we can continue to have a wonderful, wonderful uh, church conference. So the first thing is dealing with technology. Strategic plan speaks of that. We're going to have to do it and leverage it. And based on the strategic plan, we should have that pretty much perfected uh, according to the strategic plan by 2026. Uh, the next thing I wanted to share is this whole notion of uh, uh, training and 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 workshops for our officers and for our pastors. We've got to do that. And we can do that, by the way, uh, through the presiding elders, particularly as it relates to pastors. I'm convinced that the number one priority of a presiding elder, which I am, is training and, and giving leadership. Also, I want to deal with this thing on evangelism and discipleship. 
Now, Skip, I need to share this while I'm here. I hate to say it, but if we're going to deal with it now, we have to deal with the Bible. And that's this coincides with my third point. The Bible is the is the foundation. And within that Bible, that deals with this whole notion of evangelism and ultimately discipleship. See, everybody, what I'm saying, I hate to say it, but I have to say it because it's biblical. In 1 Corinthians 12, and you know I'm a Bible person, at the end of the day, everybody has different gifts. Everybody don't have the evangelism. It's no sense in putting people out there and, 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 and you know, the spiritual gift surveys are very good. I use it all the time. And they don't have a clue what they're doing. And yet we expect a different result. We need to deal with those persons who have the gift of, of evangelism. And with that gift of evangelism, then that will help us with the discipleship portion, which is the most difficult part because evangelism is much easier to get them in, but it's very difficult to keep them. And that's through the discipleship phrase. And of course, community and economic development. You've heard me say this on so many different times. We're going to have to do something, have some other financial streams in order to offset this local, the local church as it relates to conference claim. Now, some folks would say, don't say anything about conference claim. Yes, I am, because it's a part of who we are. It's the fabric of who we are. But there are other ways, and other aspirants have said it, there are other ways that we can finance that $4.9 million budget is what it is in the CME church. I don't understand for the life of me why we have, cannot, and not that we can in the future, but why we have not offset that $5 million when we have other judicatories out there owning the McDonald's of the world and owning the, the, the Popeyes of the world and other, other, other uh, franchises of the world. And they're doing fine even during the pandemic. We've got to come up with ways, and some people may not like this, but I think that we not only should have nonprofit, but we need to start looking at some for profit. So with that said, my brother, that's where I am as it relates to community, economic development, evangelism, training, and of course we need to leverage according to the strategic plan, our technology. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Wayne. Let's yeah. talk about Africa for a minute because I can Africa? hear- oh, I man. Can, I can hear Reverend Mary McKinney, you know, oh, wow. a, a wonderful devoted sister who is concerned like many about the future of our brothers and sisters in Africa. So tell us about what kind of bishop you would be, should you be elected and assigned to the continent of Africa in one of the Episcopal districts. I appreciate that. I'm trying to be calm when you ask that question. I know I get excited because I love the 10th and the 11th Episcopal district. Brother Skip, I've been to the 10th Episcopal District over four times and six times with the 11th Episcopal District. Wow. I've been over there quite a bit. I remember when Bishop Carter, who at that time was Reverend Dr. Kenneth Wayne Carter, I was there when he brought his group from Carter Metropolitan and brought them there when Bishop Cunningham was the bishop. In. And he vowed then that if, if I'm elected, he didn't know where it was going to be. He said, but if I'm elected, I'm going to make sure that we hit the ground running. And I want you to know he did hit the ground running. I've been there again with Bishop Cunningham. And then when I would go over there several times with Bishop Carter, Bishop Carter uh, is a man after my own heart when he comes down to rolling up your shirt sleeve and going to work. Mary McKinney and so many others know that. One of the things I love in the 10th Episcopal District is, uh, first of all, they are committed to CMEs. Brothers and sisters, for those who don't know it, the 10th Episcopal District literally have been around for over 70, 60 or 70 years. They are solid CME, solid in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. By the grace of God, I was there another time with Bishop Carter uh, when the 10th Episcopal District went into this beautiful building called the Breeding Montgomery Bible College. And I was there when the first 
graduating class was there. And to show the commitment of these CMEs, 110 degrees, the commitment of CMEs, they stood there at attention before it was time to go in. And I was wondering why didn't they just fall out? But they stood there. They stood there sweating 110 degrees with this stole on that said, I'm proud to be a CME. And they had the emblem on and they were just sitting, sitting there basically just, just marking time. The church is marching on. The gates of hell shall not be built. The church is marching on. And all I'm saying to you is the commitment that they have over there. I'm, I, and I was so grateful to be a part of that over four different times. And now I think uh, Eleanor Ham, Dr. Ham, her name is on the Breeding Montgomery Bible College. And we think we have about $10,000 in the budget that we try to give just to Breeding Montgomery. Now, to the 11th Episcopal District by Bishop King, I was over there with him over six different times. I was over there. Brother Mongongo, not Dr. Mongongo, who is a brother, who is a dear friend and brother. Mongongo is who I call the father of the 11th. He was there navigating with Bishop Bishop Carter and Mary McKinney and so many others. He was the one that started this whole process. And so many times I was over there, just one thing and I let it go. And that is when in 2019, after I'd been over there all the time with Bishop King, then I went over in 19 with Bishop Carter and he had the first unity summit. That is the, the, the 10th and 11th meeting together. He said to me, Wayne, what I need for you to do is go out and go under the tent and there's gonna be a lot of fighting in terms of their cultural differences. I need for you to take the book of discipline and go and teach all the presiding elders in the 10th and 11th Episcopal district about our book of discipline. And that's exactly what I did because people need to understand there are cultural fights that are going on in Africa. There are cultural fights. And those are the things that we're struggling with uh, for those who, bishops who've gone over and those who understand the intricacies of that, of the group. So I just want to let you know this. I have videos to prove it, but I just wanted to let you know how much, how involved I've been in the 10th Episcopal District, how involved I've been in the 11th Episcopal District. And lastly, we don't need to take them for granted. I think we need to raise our budget a little bit more. I think it's a joke with 17 churches to have the little budget that we have. I even think that the budget should be raised. Not so much, not so much raised now. Oh, I already can see everybody. Wait a minute. I'm not saying raise outside of the budget that we have, but find ways to increase the budget to let the people know in Africa that you are just as much a part of this denomination as anybody else. So I love Africa. The 10th and 11th district is dear to my heart. Amen. I, I can see there was a tinge of excitement uh, when that uh, subject came up with regards to Africa. Uh, and I'm certain that they, they appreciate that. Wayne, so let's talk a little bit. We talked earlier about ministry to men, the importance of men being in the church, young adults and you. So uh, give us your thoughts on what you would do as an Episcopal leader uh, to ensure the continued engagement and retention of youth and young adults uh, and, and men in our church. Let me start with the men. First of all, let's pull the cover off of it. Um, there are talk around our denomination that we think we're going to take, eradicate the ministry to men and put it under the lay department. And that was also alluded to in the strategic plan. My thing is I'm not against that as much as 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 making the the men still a, a separate entity. That is why not look at putting the men as a connectional ministry, as a connectional ministry, and they will still have their own credibility. What I'm saying is there's room, there is need for the men in our church as it is for women in our church. I remember some time ago, to show you how passionate I am with the ministry of the men, uh, 
several years when I passed the St. Luke CME Church in Treeport, I and I, we would have a retreat, just men retreat strictly, putting our, the cover off of it and, and letting our hair down and talk about men item. For example, excuse some of you this personal reference, but how to deal with possible things that prostate cancer and things of that nature. We would bring in doctors and, and, and all of these kind of people that would come and talk to us. And one of the years in Shreveport, Louisiana, I invited the uh, Dr. Leo Pinkett and Dr. Victor Taylor of the lay department at that point. Both of them flew to Shreveport and we went down to Texas and had a wonderful time. So I'm saying to you how important I, of the men are in this church because it leveraged in my position, in my uh, belief, that it leverages the church when the men are inextricably involved. Now, with respect to the young adults, that's another one that's a stronghold for me because I was a young adult president, the third, if you will, uh, I Kentrell was the first, Ronald Walker was the second, I was the third, and I was also the fourth. By the grace of God, I was elected twice by my peers. Uh, I've been hearing people talk about they are adults and things of that nature. You're right, but at the end of the day, I believe it is pages, uh, what is it, 256 and no, 236 and 237 in the blue book and I met in our updated discipline. They're, they are part of the church, though. So we realize that they are grown, but but they are part of the uniqueness of the CME Church. One of the things when I was elected, Skip, in 1988, um, we had to try to find our identity. We were still growing. And in 1990, that was a move, that was a push to completely get rid of uh, uh, basically that's a bad word, uh, to cut the age to 18 to 22. Now, that crowd is basically in college. So really, there really is not going to be any emphasis on young adult ministry. So we had to get to the General Conference in 1990 in Arlington, Texas, even though they voted, uh, it was in the blue book to say that we want to concur with this, and we say we're not going to concur. And we stayed up, the, the Teresa Duharts of the world and the Victor Taylors of the world, and, and I can just keep going on of the world that was young adults during my time. And we fought all times of night to try to keep that in there. So those of you who are over the age of 22, somebody had to fight for you. Somebody had to fight for you. And my administration fought to keep the age from 18 to 35. Now, some people said that 18 to 35 years old, some people say that, hey, an 18-year-old cannot relate to a 35-year-old. I get that. But the discipline gives you a wide range. When we framed the first constitution in 1980, we dealt with that from other judicatories. One in particular happens to be our, our sister, United Methodist Church. And we dealt with that 18 to 20, okay, 20 to 25, and 25 to 30, and 30 to 35. And those were the divisions. Now, you have the latitude to do whatever you want to do with that. In some churches, you may not have that wide range. So you do whatever you want to do based upon the ages of your church. So I think it needs to stay 18 to 35. I really do. And it's based upon, again, uh, where you are in your church. And with that said, uh, uh, skip as it relates to young adult ministry. I think uh, that, oh, I know what it was. And it was the uh, age, the uh, paragraph 201.4. At that point in the 1986 discipline, okay, when Bishop Brown was elected, in the 86 discipline, um, the paragraph was 201.4 that said there must be at least one young adult to the general conference for each annual conference. There, uh, that was a large conspiracy also that wanted to kill that. And we had to fight that in 1990 to keep that in there. And now you got to have young adults in, uh, in clergy and laity from your local church. I mean, from your uh, 
uh, annual conference to be a part. So my administration was fighting, fighting, fighting to keep young adults credible. And after I, my administration in 1986, 1996, when I came out, Stephen Hart was elected. And that's when we got our first little money. Because under me, I didn't get a single red penny from the CME Church as it relates to my budget. But I was right there representing my people because I was blessed to work at Federal Express Corporation. And I flew jump seat all over the entire world representing the young adult. Very viable. So young adults, keep it up. Keep up the fight. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. So you you alluded to and I read you you worked up under a lot of bishops uh, over your lifetime. So let me ask this question as I've asked the other ones. In your opinion, is the bishop a pastor's pastor? Why? Why? Why not? How would you well, respond? To uh, that? Uh, I, I'm going to just tell you, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, by the mere fact that they are bishop, first of all, shares that they are already in a spiritual position. A bishop is already spiritual by the mere fact that he or she is elected uh, because they could not be a bishop unless you have been going through the process as a deacon, elder, in full connection. So they are already spiritual in their own right. However, I do, I am concerned about this old notion of the pastor's pastor. I'm not so sure if I would say that. that it's an administrative position. And as an administrative position, they're to be sensitive. Of course, they pray. They need to use their godly judgment. But I think that the bishops uh, would be working through the presiding elders. I would lean heavily on these presiding elders. Once these elders get the proper training. So I would have the retreats once a year for the presiding elders. And I expect them to carry out what I what God has given me. And I'm going to give that vision to them so that they can carry it to the pastor and the pastors to the local church. So I, I, I'm not so sure uh, about the pastor's pastor. I think uh, that this administrative position but with a spiritual, spiritual twist. So as I asked Dr. Washington the question, which kind of um, follows this, what, what kind of bishop would you be? I'm the kind of bishop that, based upon my theme, a com an experienced, compassionate leader with a compassionate heart. An experienced servant leader. An experienced servant leader with a compassionate heart. You can't be in leadership without first being a servant. The problem with a lot of people is they want to be. No, no, no. You've got to be, first of all, a servant first before you can become a leader. I would listen, 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 listen to the people. I would listen to the people. And how I, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I like the PPRC, that is the Pastors, uh, uh, Pastor Parish Relation Committee that the United Methodists have. I like it. I really do. Because it involves everybody from the bishop to the district superintendent, you know, the United Methodist Church, all the way to the pastor. Uh, those persons are appointed uh, in the United Methodist Church from the uh, uh, the, the uh, church uh, conference. Uh, and what they do, they pick certain folks after they vote on them. And that involves everybody, not to hurt anybody, but to work with each other and to make sure that it might be a good fit. That's And, and, and that's where I am as it relates to appointments. You see, if you do that, then the people are more open, including the person that possibly may be moved, uh, can say, hey, look, uh, I'm not doing X, Y, and Z. One of the things in the discipline is this whole notion of evaluation. I would give every three months, every presiding elder has to give me a three-month report, period, period. I need a report every quarter of all of the churches in that quarter. Now, we're going to give that person tools to work with. You don't just move people and, and not have tools for them to work with. Give them something to work with. And then once you give them the tools, and that's what a, a retreat would be for, once you give them the tools to work with, 
then you can begin to hold them accountable for what you're talking about. But make sure that you give them the tools to work with. And that's why you need to train the presiding elders in a retreat first so that they can carry out the, the uh, wishes of what, uh, the vision rather, of what God has given you. So it's important when you make appointments because it's a, it's such a, it, it, it is the most important thing for a bishop. I've seen these six bishops that I've served under cry, 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 cry. Because a lot of times you just don't have any more. I'm the one typing up the appointments. I know what I'm talking about. I'm there with them struggling. I'm going to give you this last example. Bishop Thomas Lanier Hart Jr. Uh, Bishop Hart would struggle with appointments so much until he would fall asleep. And the presiding elders would be there in the respective regions. And they just sit there till they get his nap out. And sometimes it's two or three or four in the morning. And Bishop Hart would just sit there just like this. And then when he wake up, he said, now where were we? With his pen in his hand. And the elders are just sitting there waiting on the bishop to get his nap out. He was just that serious because you're dealing with persons' lives. And you have to be careful of that when you deal with persons' lives because it affects them for the rest of their life. So I do believe that that component called godly judgment is still popular in the Christian Methodist Church. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wayne. So my, my last question to you, and it's, it's a few parts of this question, has to do with church growth, has to do with your vision for winning souls, for church growth, church planning and expansion. Because if there's anything that we've learned from the pandemic is that we will not do church the same. You've already alluded to that earlier. So talk about your vision then, should you be elected and appointed for expanding uh, our church uh, in this post-pandemic time that you'll be serving in? Well, I appreciate you using the word post-pandemic. We're still in it, but I do appreciate what you're using about post-pandemic because the reality is we can no longer do business as usual. We must be hybrid, hybrid in everything we do. And, and one of the things that I would do in terms of a vision, Bishop, the late Bishop Betts, bless his heart, Bishop Best says it best as it relates to going back to the basics. The first thing, and, and you've heard me say this on a number of occasions, you've got to go back and nurture the local church. Everything rises and falls on the local church. The local church sick, the CME church is sick. There is no district, there is no regional, there is no connectional without the local church being healthy. And some way, somehow, we've got to go back. And at a time, Skip, I hate to say it, but I'm a, I'm a biblical person. I think at times, sometimes we've lost our first love. We've lost our first love, and we need to go back at the you know, seven churches of Asia Minor, talk about that. But we need to go back to the churches called commendation versus the one that are condemnation. The commendation that Jesus used was the church at Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. All of the other churches, Jesus condemned them because they did this and they did that. If we're going to be vile in the CME church, we've got to go back to the basics, which is having a biblical foundation. We got to go back to the biblical. That's what John Wesley said. When we go back and study the historicity of Wesleyanism, it goes back to John Wesley being a person of one book, and we've got to go back and make that foundational. Once we do that, it's impossible then, if that is taken care of, it's impossible then for us not to look at evangelism. Go ye therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the eschatos of the cosmos, even to the end of the world. We've got to go back there and make sure that we use every form of technology we can. Now, I'm a presiding elf. Some of my skip, they don't have the Wi-Fi. You see what I'm saying? So we've got to find ways, go to the city, whatever we need to do and say, hey, we are a church. We've got to have you 
to, to make sure that these towers are up here because we can't operate this way in the post-pandemic season. So we need for you to make sure that we have access to the Wi-Fi. And once that's done, then we will be able to communicate to the masses. That's where I am as it relates thank, to that. Thank, thank you so much for responding to that. The, the last question comes from uh, a viewer, it has to do with appointments. Were you on multiple year appointments? Are you in favor of it? Or is it just an annual appointment for you? Or how do you assess a situation uh, and this would be the last question before we get into your closing statement. Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, that's, good. that's a good question. Whoever came up with it is good. I, I'm very leery. I'm very leery of these yearly, I mean, this four year type appointments. So many things can come up. I'm old school for what, you know. I'm old school. And the reality is, I think that we ought to look at one year at a time. If that person is worth his or her salt, or whenever, for lack of a better word, they'll still be worth his or her salt the next year as well. So my thing is, I don't want to confuse as a servant leader with a compassionate heart. I don't want to confuse the congregation. Does that make sense? I don't want to confuse them because this pastor go out and show. Now, look, I'm going to be with y'all. See it here? Bishop didn't appointed me here four years, and ain't nothing y'all can do about it. Wait, 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 wait now, wait. So many things can happen. Sickness, and some folk, I hate to say, cut act a fool uh, that, that might be there, and, and arrogant when they have that type of thing. So uh, uh, because I would have the appointing power, I would rather do that prayerfully and cautiously each year so that we can have, uh, shall I say, more control of it. I don't think I would give the four-year appointment. If, again, if that person uh, have not done anything, what's wrong with reappointing that person the next year? I'll be very cautious in that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. So I'm going to give you now an opportunity to make your closing case, your closing argument, your closing statement to all of the wonderful delegates watching both in Africa and in the States uh, as to why you, why you should be elected bishop of our church for this season and time uh, that we're living in. Would you take a two minutes to make your closing? Uh, statement? Well, I certainly do that. And again, I want to thank you and the College of Bishops again for allowing you to have this platform. I'm a third generation CME. From the bottom of my heart, I believe that my time is now based upon the experiences that I've sent each and every one of you that are delegates and alternates to this general conference. I believe I'm seasoned and I believe I'm ready. Now, because I've served six bishops, I don't have to wait until the next week or the next two weeks to get started. I can get started immediately after July 1. Now, I do know that the uh, there's going to be orientation for bishops after that, but that's something that I don't, that's, that's, that's above my pay scale. But after that, in terms of organizing the conference, in terms of doing all of that, I've done it under six bishops. And you all have seen my work, particularly in a, in a, uh, a servanthood position, missionary, you've seen my work. Laity, you've seen my work that God has gifted me to do. So if elected, I would continue with that continuum of being an servant leader with a compassionate heart. Not that I won't be firm, but I would have a compassionate heart. Now, Skip, I need to say this, and I want to let it go. I was, I was, I was praying, and the Lord said it's okay to go ahead and say it. There are over fourteen people running for bishop here. One of the four, or possibly five, will be elected. I've been here once. I've ran once, lost. Several others have ran, lost, and several bishops that are elected now ran, lost. I'm making this point to say this. 
that's not the four, five, who knows, maybe even six or seven. We don't know what God is going to do. But I am saying this. If you don't make it, because of my love for this church, I want you to hear my heart. The candidates that are running now, I've been there, and the candidates for the future, don't get bitter. Please don't leave this church. We need you. If it don't work your way, please don't leave the church. We already are leaving by the droves now, and we need you in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. God did not call us to be successful, but God did call us to be faithful. Be thy faithful unto death, and I will give you a Stephanus of Zoe, or I will give you a crown of life. I solicit your prayers, not only for me, but for the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. We need to pray y'all these next 14 days that God's will, that God's will will be done. I solicit your prayers and I solicit as not 64 and all of that. Give me this number. I'm not interested in that, but I would just solicit your vote as one of whatever number, Bishop in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Thanks again, Skip. God bless you. And I hope to see you in Sissy, in Cincinnati, affectionately known as the Queen City. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Wayne Williams, for the generosity of your time. Pray God's blessings on you. Uh, and uh, let me bring back up these other wonderful aspirants who have spent uh, almost two and a half hours uh, of their time uh, with us uh, today. Uh, Reverend uh, Anders Modis just stepped away from her uh, from her desk. But I'm so grateful to you. And I know, I believe the church is. Reverend Anders Modis, if you can hear me, please join us back on uh, at this time. Uh, amen. There she is. Amen. Thank you for the generosity of your time. Uh, thank you for the journey that you've taken. Uh, the sacrifice that you all have made uh, over the last uh, two years uh, or so. Uh, and I appreciate it. And I know the church appreciates it because I'm looking at the comments and uh, all of them are just sending their gratitude and thanks. Our church is in good hands. Yes. Amen. Our church Amen. is in great hands with any one yes. of the aspirants uh, that have come before <laughs> us. That I know, and I'll stand Absolutely. Uh, But we pray that God will move uh, mm -hmm. and God will allow us to elect the ones that are needed for this time um, uh, yes. in our church. Uh, but God right. bless you. Uh, as I've said to others, if I if if, if it will, I'll I buy you a, a, a happy meal in Cincinnati. <laughs> I'm waiting uh, on it. I will all my happy meals in Cincinnati. Uh, <laughs> But I just pray that we get happy in Cincinnati amen, amen. Uh, and do God's will. But God bless you. Thank you all so much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you. Safe travels uh, to uh, Cincinnati. Let me say this uh, as I remove them from the screen so they can go and enjoy the rest of their Sundays. Let me say thank you to you, Brother Skip. For thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. One and thank only, you Skip Mason. One and only. Amen. I appreciate Amen. all of you. Thank you so much. All now right, go God. and enjoy the rest of your uh, Sunday evening. God bless you and thank you all uh, again. And we'll see you soon. Thank you all. Now, look, join me. My last show before the um, general conference is on Monday, June 20th at 8 p.m. You will not want to miss it. I got a whole bunch of special guests who will be here, including some of the bishops, some of the chairs of the local convention, the music. We're going to talk about the great music that's going to be shared. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Duhart will be on as well to talk about the communication. Is this going to be streamed live for those of you who are not going to be able to make it? So please join me on Monday, June 20th uh, for this preview of everything you want to know uh, about the general conference. Uh, or in other words, how to get your Cincy on. That's what they're saying in Cincinnati. <laughs> how to get your Cincy on. God bless you. 
Have a great evening. Continue to pray for our aspirants and continue, most importantly, uh, brothers and sisters, to uh, pray for our uh, beloved church. It has been a joy to share these wonderful uh, candidates uh, with you uh, on this evening. Go in love and go in peace and go with the joy of Jesus.